Hi there, my name is Catherine Au. I'm an environmental specialist at ICF. And to get our webinar started, I'd like to introduce Glenn Schroeder at HUD's Office of Environment and Energy to say a few words. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us on what is OEE, Office of Environment and Energy's uh, first webinar in a series of three all about addressing radon for HUD-supported projects. Uh, this webinar, of course, is part of HUD's commitment to providing housing that is decent, safe, sanitary, and good repair for all residents of HUD-supported housing. Uh, last check, we had over a thousand uh, different folks registered just for this radon event alone. I want to thank you all for uh, being here, for joining us today uh, for that commitment as well. I also want to give a big thanks to the National Radon Program Services at Kansas State University uh, for helping support uh, the development of this webinar series, as well as staff from there are here today to help answer your questions during the Q&A support. Um, their support was uh, really integral, and I want to thank them. Uh, as many of you are aware, HUD currently is in the process of developing a department-wide policy on addressing radon in the HUD environmental review process, which would be for the first time ever that HUD addresses residential rad radon exposure at the department-wide level. Uh, as part of that, just want to give a reminder that this webinar, as well as the one uh, next month, will not be covering this or any other HUD-specific policies regarding radon. And uh, with this and the following webinar, we will not be able to answer uh, questions on HUD-specific policies regarding radon. However, our third way, third webinar, um, which will be all about the final department-wide radon policy, uh, which will occur at a time to be determined uh, sometime, perhaps September after the policy is published. At that time, at that third webinar, we will be able to take all your questions about that final policy once it is published. So I just want to thank you all again for your uh, commitment to supporting safe and sanitary housing. I'm now going to hand it back over to our partners at ICF to begin the webinar. Thanks again, everyone. Great. Thanks, Glenn, for those words. As Glenn just mentioned, this is the first in a series of webinars on radon. Today, the focus is on existing information, what radon is, what are the health effects, how it gets into homes, how to find state-specific, regional-specific information on risks and resources, um, and also basic overview of testing and mitigation in single family homes. The next webinar, which will be in about three weeks, August 14th, is on radon testing and mitigation, specifically the industry, the industry standards uh, that are in effect for certified mitigation and testing professionals. Uh, that is what the industry standards are um, for those who are certified and not, as Glenn mentioned, not that does not have to do with HUD's department-wide policy. And then the third webinar to be determined is going to be after HUD's upcoming department-wide policy on radon gets uh, finalized. And so once we have that, we will let you know about when the date will be for the third webinar explaining the policy and implications for HUD programs. There are already existing HUD resources on the information on radon. Um, on the HUD Exchange website, there is a previous webinar series from two summers ago where you can learn more about testing, uh, the science and the basics and different mitigation, uh, especially with regard to multifamily homes. So there's already a really informative webinar series out there that you can use to get more information if uh, you are curious. And there's also a website uh, through the HUD Office of Lead Hazard Control in Healthy Homes that also offers more information. You can see the existing HUD Office of Multifamily Development radon policy there, um, as well as some other HUD guidance that's program by program. 
And before we get started with the rest of the presentation, I want to get to know you guys better and see who is with us joining in today live. Um, so what type of organization do you represent? You should see a poll question popping up on your screen right now, and you can uh, click that, uh, uh, click uh, whichever answer pertains to you, submit that, and then we will get a better idea of who's joining us today. Are you a state and city government, uh, perhaps a CDBG entitlement community? Are you a state government, maybe someone who manages the state CDBG program, a public housing authority? Are you a tribe or tribally designated housing entity? Or are you someone else who's curious about radon and just wants to listen in? And we'll give a few more seconds for that. Okay, so as expected, majority of you are going to be city county governments. Quite a few of you are from state governments, some representation from public housing authorities and tribes, and then lots of you are actually other folks. So uh, welcome everyone. Glad to have you on today. And then a second poll question, just to see it sort of see what the baseline knowledge is. Have you ever had a home tested for radon? whether it's by yourself, by a professional, a uh, mail-in kit, or a digital monitor, or maybe you've had a slew of things done in your home and you're not quite sure what was tested. We'll close this one in a few seconds. Okay, so almost 50-50 split. Uh, more of you haven't tested your houses, but quite a few of you have. And then a portion of you aren't clear um, and that's totally understandable. So we will go over basics of testing, not, not too much detail, but just a little bit to uh, get your feet wet today. But first, the basics. Uh, some of you, this might be the first time you're really learning about radon. So what is radon? It is a naturally occurring odorless gas. It is a radioactive element, and it occurs all over the Earth within the Earth's crust. Um, it's, the source is uranium. It is a decay product of uranium, and it emits alpha radiation. Um, on the right hand side, I have a very simplified graphic of uranium changing to radon, changing to polonium. Um, that's extremely simplified. There are a couple of other steps that I skipped between uranium and radon. Uh, the key points to know is that are that uh, radioactive elements are unstable. They change or they decay into other elements. And during that process, they emit the alpha radiation. And uh, that's what can be harmful to health. And here I want to show you, uh, even though I said it's a odorless gas, um, there are ways to visualize radon. You, you can't see it normally, you can't hear it. Um, there isn't a way for your human body to detect radon, um, but there, there are ways of uh, technology that you can use to visualize radon. So let me show you what that looks like real quickly. Radon is everywhere, even in this classroom. If you look in this cloud chamber, you will see tracks left by alpha particles from radon atoms that happened to be in the chamber when the lid was put on. Those short, bright streaks you see in there are the radon alphas. Notice that there are only a few alpha trails in the chamber at any time. This is a very low level of radon that we don't need to worry about. But in certain parts of the country, there are houses with a lot of radon in their basements. What would the cloud chamber look like in one of these basements? This basement has been measured 
with a radon level of 100 picocuries per liter. Come look at this. Oh my god. All right, so hopefully you get the idea. The cloud streaks that you saw are the trails from the alpha particles, that radiation that's being emitted from the radon as it's breaking down into other elements. All right, now another audience poll, again, just to get your baseline uh, information of what you know currently. So, um, and yeah, what health effects do you think radon exposure can lead to? Uh, here it's a uh, single choice. Uh, can it lead to headache, skin rash, cancer, blindness, or vomiting? Some studies on general citizen awareness of radon have shown that folks, some folks in some places really don't know what what the big deal of radon is, and they, they do get this wrong. So just kind of see what um, this current audience, well, what we think the, the issues with radon exposure are. I'll give a few more seconds. Okay, so some of you said headache, very few of you said skin rash and vomiting, and most of you said cancer. Um, and so this is consistent with what studies show. Uh, cancer is the main thing we're talking about. Radon exposure does not lead to headache. A lot of people think that, but it's not true. The, the main effect is going to be cancer. And I uh, kept mentioning radon breaks down into other elements and emits radiation. So when you're breathing in these gases, these radioactive elements into your lungs, and those elements give off those radiation particles, that radiation damages your lung cells and can lead to lung cancer. Um, it's especially potent in folks who are smokers. The combination of smoking and radon exposure really multiplies the risk of getting cancer. But even in folks who don't smoke, radon is the number one cause of lung cancer in folks who don't smoke. So uh, it's a risk for anyone. And then from this EPA graphic, you can see uh, one in 15 homes tests high for radon levels. That's a national average. It's going to be different in different parts of the country. Some states you might have one in two homes, one in three homes testing high for radon, and other states might be one in 20, one in 30. And we'll talk more about the state risks in, uh, or the geographic risks uh, in a couple of slides. Um, from 2003 data, uh, the EPA estimate is that uh, each year radon causes 21,000 deaths from lung cancer. That number hasn't really been updated in the last 20 years, but it's uh, what we currently have. What levels of radon should I be worrying about then? Here you see a scale from zero to infinity. The units are in picocuries per liter, which is how radon is measured in the United States. Internationally or uh, by certain digital monitors, you might see a different unit. That's a BQ over M3, that's Becquerel's per meter squared. Uh, don't worry about that. All of the US numbers, um, for the most part, are going to be in picocuries per liter. And on the scale, I've divided the numbers into one, two, three, four, and then infinity. There is no upper limit. From the video, we could see, you know, that was someone's home with 100 picocuries per liter. So it's even though here I'm just showing up to four, it can really go a lot higher. And the numbers we're going to uh, worry about, I'm gonna to toss out a few numbers here. The first one, 0.4 picocuries per liter, that's the average outdoor concentration. Um, just an average, it doesn't mean that if you walk outside, it's exactly gonna be 0.4, it's just going to be a national average. 1.3 picocuries per liter is the average indoor concentration. 
2.7, it's just a number I'm going to throw out there, but you don't need to memorize it. You don't need to do anything about it. It's the World Health Organization action level. And that's because scientific studies show 2.7 picocuries per liter exposure. That's when you start really seeing the increased incidence of lung cancer. Um, there is no US policy around that number. So it's just a trivia question. And finally, 4.0 picocuries per liter, that is the EPA action level where studies show where if you mitigate your buildings below that number, that can really significantly reduce the number of radon induced deaths from lung cancer. And so that 4.0 number is where we're going to really focus on in the future webinars. And uh, we did say we would not talk about HUD policy on radon, but I do want to show you, give you a preview, um, if this isn't obvious already, to where radon fits in in HUD's process in terms of the environmental review. And those of you who are familiar with HUD environmental reviews or not, the regulation, the HUD regulation, 24 CFR 58.5I, uh, 2I is where it says that HUD policy is that all policy, all properties being proposed for use in HUD programs be free of hazardous materials, contamination, toxic chemicals and gases, and radioactive substances where a hazard could affect the health and safety of occupants or conflict with the end use of the property. And so this is sort of a catch all for all sorts of things, uh, whether it's oil spills, different chemicals that can contaminate a property, lead based paint, asbestos. And so radon would fall under this part. And in terms of the environmental review and actually documenting it in your forms, you might uh, recognize this as the 58 Five checklist in the categorically excluded subject to 585 environmental review forms for HUD, as well as the environmental assessments. And in the 585 checklist, which used to be called the statutory worksheet, the you would talk about any radon testing, um, as well as any mitigation under contamination and toxic substances. You would not talk about it under Clean Air Act because radon and clean, uh, doesn't pertain to Clean Air Act. And then in the environmental assessment, in addition to that checklist, there's another checklist under the environmental assessment checklist where under land development, there's a section on hazards and nuisances, including site safety and noise. And that really refers to safety during construction. So if you do have a building with high radon levels that need to be mitigated, you also wanna think about any worker protection so that the folks who are doing the mitigation or the construction aren't exposing themselves to dangerous levels of radiation exposure. So if you had to formulate any plan like that, then you would record that in this section of the environmental review. Again, I'm not going into what HUD is requiring regarding radon. I'm just telling you, this is where you would document anything in the environmental review regarding radon. And then those of you who are using HEROES, which is probably most of you, at least the cities and counties, uh, you would document that in the checklist and this is what it would look like there. Moving on to state regulations. Uh, this is something that you should research for your own state what the requirements are in your state, if any. Uh, there are numerous regulations regarding radon out there and they do differ by state. Some are more prevalent and some are very rare. And they include requirements for disclosure to buyers. So if you're a seller selling a piece of property, you have to let your buyers or potential buyers know uh, whether you tested for certain things and whether there is a presence of hazards such as lead-based paint, asbestos, radon. And so many states have those types of regulations. You have some states where you have to disclose those hazards to tenants if you're a landlord renting out units to tenants. Some states talk about requirements for certification of radon mitigation professionals, meaning that anyone who's a contractor in that state who performs radon mitigation services 
has to meet certain certification requirements. Some states have requirements for testing of certain types of properties, such as public buildings, schools, daycares, and foster homes. Some states have requirements for mitigation and whether that whether mitigation has to follow any standards. And then some states also have requirements for radon resistant new construction where new, new buildings or certain types of new buildings in counties or zones with high radon risk uh, might be required to be built using radon resistant new construction techniques. I'll talk more about what those techniques are in the next webinar. Here's a map uh, from a website of the policy surveillance program. This is from 2016, but it, it compiled a list of all the different states with different regulations. And you can filter uh, which regulation you want to uh, look for and see which states have those types of regulations. And here, this view, you can see these are the 37 states as of 2016 that have seller disclosure laws, where I mentioned if you're selling a property in that state, you have to let the potential buyer know um, if you've tested for certain potential hazards and what those results are. In contrast, from 2016, these are the states that have landlord disclosure laws. So if you're a tenant or a renter looking to rent from a landlord, only these four states require that the landlord let the tenants know whether they've tested for certain things and what those results are if they tested for them. A lot of you uh, submitted questions during registration and I thank you for that because it really helps frame the conversation in terms of what knowledge needs to be uh, disseminated and what folks want to be aware of. And many of you asked about what is my radon risk in my state or in my city, in my location? Is it high? Is it low? I don't know. Or some of you said, well, why am I testing for this if my state or my county has a low radon risk? Why am I doing this? And so here I want to discuss more about the risk by location and what that means for your programs. Not in the HUD context, but more just generally. Many of you will be familiar with the EPA radon zones. Um, if you've ever seen a map of radon zones, it's probably this one. And this is from the 1990s, gathering information from the average test results plus different soil types and a few other factors. This is the map that EPA came out with. And they have this map at the state level as well. And they break the data down into three different zones. Zone one is on average, buildings are going to have more than four picocuries per liter concentration of radon. Zone two is between two to four picocuries and zone three is less than two picocuries. This map is uh, pretty widespread and if anyone's ever seen a radon map, this is the one that most people are aware of. Uh, but one thing you may not understand about this map is there is a disclaimer on the top of the website where this map is shown saying that the purpose of this map is to assist national, state, and local organizations in targeting their resources and implementing radon resistant building codes. It's more about, okay, overall certain areas have a really high risk, so let's maybe focus on encouraging certain counties to develop building codes where you use radon resistant new construction techniques. Or maybe we should have an education campaign so that folks in certain counties are encouraged to test more. It doesn't mean that other homes in zone three are gonna not have high radon levels. It does not talk about individual risk. So, you know, even if you're one in 15 or one in 50, you, your house could still be that one home in 50 homes that has a high rate on level. There's really no way to know. The most important way to figure out what your rate on level is going to be is to test your home or your building. 
To illustrate that point further, where a lot of studies have shown that those EPA county level maps don't really give useful information about individual buildings. Here are some state maps uh, where they have finer tuned or finer grained data. On the left is a California map, and you can see Los Angeles County here, where on the whole, Los Angeles County might be, I think, in zone two, but the risk is really stratified by location. And this is based on the underlying geology and the soil types. And so like even within a county, there's wide variation on what that risk is going to be. And for California, these maps are only available for a few counties. They're working on it. It takes time to develop these databases and test them out. So hopefully in the future, California might have the whole state mapped. But at the moment, it's only available for a few counties. On the right hand side, you can see Salt Lake County, Utah, and certain sections of it. Again, the shading shows different risk levels. So even within a county, even if your county is high, medium, or low, it doesn't really mean anything because based on the geology, the, the soil types, and also the construction techniques um, and uh, construction practices, like one home, your home and your neighbor's home could be very different in radon levels. Another source of information to learn more about what's going on in your state is the National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network, which is a database run by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC. And on this website, you click on Explore Data, and it will give you a window with a, a query panel uh, where you select different parameters. And so step one, select radon, tests from labs, and I chose the number of pre-mitigation radon levels uh, by different levels. Um, and I want to see that at the state level by county for all years that they have data for and all concentrations. And for Texas, which on the EPA maps show on average very low risk, here uh, on the first, on this map on the left, I filtered for how many tests came out with under two picocuries per liter. And I have selected Travis County, Texas, uh, which is where Austin, Texas is on the bottom. You can, you can see that 326 tests came out with a pretty low level of radon. Okay, so what does that mean? If I change the filter to the number of tests that were above four picocuries per liter, I found 39. And then uh, two to four, I just checked earlier, they had 62. Um, that's, that means that about one in 13 homes in Travis County are testing high for radon levels. And bear in mind, this is where Austin, Texas is, and only four or 500 tests have been done for a county with millions of people. So that's not really scientifically representative of what the levels are. This is just what data they have. You know, folks who know enough to actually have tests done, have the resources to do the testing. And so that's the data that's being collected. And you can see all the gray counties here. Those are counties for which there isn't data. People aren't testing those counties. So you really don't know what that risk is going to be at all. More information about state level, uh, state level resources. Each state has some type of a state radon program and a website where you can find more information like any state specific testing results. This map here, I like um, in that for North Carolina, instead of showing the average result, it's showing the maximum level that they found. So here in Hayward County or Haywood County, they found levels as high as 108 picocuries per liter. Um, which is pretty scary. That's basically what we saw in the video earlier. I'm in mean, the North Carolina Radon Program, their website, you have more information, you can purchase discounted radon test kits. Every once in a while, the states will have grants to provide free testing kits, uh, usually around January, because that's, uh, I think, 
the National Radon Month. So check check your state website around December, January, February, and see if they have free tests to provide. And if so, um, good resource out there. They usually run out very quickly. Um, they'll have other information as well, courses, uh, regulations, if they have any. And if you want to find where your state uh, websites are, if you aren't able to locate it through a normal uh, internet search, then you can go through Kansas State University's National Radon Program Services and search for their state radon programs through that website. In addition to the state radon contacts, they'll also have program fact sheets for each state. And those I found pretty useful where you click you click on the fact sheet and they'll give you a list of the states and then you select the state you want. Here I've got Arizona pulled up and don't worry about reading the actual fact sheet on this slide. You can look on the website later, but each fact sheet is going to be one to two pages long. It'll give you the contact information for the program and a website if they have one. It'll give you a summary of the legal requirements um, as um, updated through 2022. So some states have pending legislation, some have enacted legislation, and some don't have any legislation. And these fact sheets will, at a glance, tell you what is uh, applicable in your state. All right, and now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Paul Raymer at ICF, um, who has extensive experience in EPA's Indoor Air Plus program. And he's going to talk more about radon in buildings. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm Paul Raymer, as Catherine said, a senior uh, advisor in building science at ICF. So with all that background, uh, let's have some fun and look at how radon moves around in buildings and a few other things. Next slide, please. First, we're going to ask you another question. Uh, what might increase your exposure to radon? So pick out what you think. So when we're uh, ready to go. All right. So the answers here we were looking for are B and C. Um, just going over them a little bit. A for A, the number of pollutants that are contained in the effluents from gas stoves and cooking, but radon isn't one of them. Living on a granite rock outcropping can be a source of radon gas, so that might be a risk of, as you guys knew. Uh, or C, the EPA's radon zone map ranks the likelihood of radon in a building from one, the highest potential, two, moderate potential, and three, low potential. Note that that EPA radon map, as Catherine mentioned, is only a recommendation was created quite a while ago. The only way to know is to test. For D, smoking doesn't increase the exposure to radon, but exposure to radon will increase the likelihood of lung cancer. Smokers with radon exposure have an even higher risk of lung cancer. It is generally believed that exposure to radon and cigarette smoking are synergistic. That is, the combined effect exceeds the sum of their independent effects. And this is because the daughters of radon often become attached to smoke and dust particles and are then able to lodge in the lungs. And finally, E, lead paint in homes built prior to 1978 can certainly be a serious hazard but it is not a source of radon. So well done. Next slide. Since radon is an odorless gas, the first question is how does it get into the building? 
and it's not exactly welcome. Three things are needed for radon gas to move. Radon gas, a hole and a force. And buildings are peppered with holes and cracks. And the forces are the building pressures constantly pulling and pushing on the structure. The stack effect can be a major force for air movement because warm air is lighter than cold air, it rises like the force that lifts a hot air balloon. As the warm air rises, it pushes against the top of the house, forcing its way out through cracks and holes. But it can't do that unless an equal amount of air is being drawn in at the bottom of the house. Some of that incoming air pulls in radon gas with it. The stack effect is even more pronounced in high-rise buildings, which actually led to the development of revolving doors. The force of the incoming air was so strong, the exit doors couldn't be pushed open. Next slide, please. There are numerous forces such as the stack effect. There's wind pressure and exhaust fans in the bathrooms and kitchens, and even undesirable air leaks and heating and cooling systems. One cubic foot of air moving into the house must be replaced by one cubic foot of air leaving the house. The air being drawn in can carry radon moisture and soil gases with it. And then there is radon that gets brought in with the water, usually from private wells, sort of like the carbonated, like a carbonated so soda drink where the carbon dioxide is dissolved in the soda and released when you open the bottle. Next slide. There are lots of holes, cracks, and gaps that connect the air in the house to gases in the ground. Sealing the cracks and holes is an integral part of any mitigation plan, but many of the cracks are too small to be visually identifiable. No foundation is completely airtight or will stay airtight over years to stop pressure-driven air motion. Next slide. A lot of factors impact the movement of air and consequently the movement of radon gas in a home. Unfortunately, it is not easily predictable. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Wind impacts the pressures in the house. Barometric pressures do as well, along with exhaust fans. Air leaks in the supply side of a warm air duct system can put the house under negative pressure. Air leaks in the return ducting in a basement can carry the radon gas throughout the house. Old rubble foundations, foundation walls have lots of gaps and cracks that are virtually impossible to seal completely. Air drawn up through interstitial cavities in walls can sometimes cause the radon levels to be higher on the upper levels of the house. Even the seasons can affect the radon levels. The only way to know if there is a problem is to measure and test. Next slide. Uh, this is another question for you. Which one of these houses is likely to have be higher, have a higher level of radon? So, photo A, you guys are good. The primary difference between these two houses is the season. The windows and doors are more likely to be open and providing more air circulation for house B, a photo of the house in the summer. So the radon concentrations might be higher in A. But the highest radon levels in my own house over the past year were when the temperatures in the house were highest. It reached 8.6 picocuries per liter at the end of September when the temperature got up to 79 degrees inside. So you can't tell just by guessing. And if these were two houses built side by side and the radon level in B was below four picocuries, 
you can't assume that it would be below for picocuries in house A. The only way to know is to measure. Next slide. So I keep telling you, you have to test for it. So how do you do it? Well, it's not hard. You have options for short-term tests or long-term tests. The left photo is a short-term test that costs between 15 and $30. The right photo is a long-term test, alpha track detector, that costs up to $60. Short-term tests are left out for two to five days and long-term tests for 90 days or more. Both tests need to be returned to a lab and in a few weeks, they will send back a report with the test results. Now, continuous monitors give you hourly measurements, which is interesting to see how the raydown levels vary with time, but variations like that can be disturbing. More detailed information on testing protocols will be presented in the next webinar. The kits should be purchased in bulk, so the price of shipping is included. If you get bids from different labs, then you can get the best prices for buying in bulk. Next slide. Note that a lab fee separate, separate from the purchase fee may apply to some tests. The test on the right is only $10, but sending it to the lab requires an additional $15 processing fee. Next slide. Continuous monitors are more expensive, but can be reused. The ones shown on the left with the purple background are the models used by professionals, and they cost at $800 or so at the, the low end. The ones shown on the right, which are $100 to $200, are not devices that are proved by the NRPP or the NRSB. Continuous radon monitors give hourly data unlike the short-term or long-term tests, which give an average. You'll see more dips and spikes in data with continuous radon monitors. You might want to refer to the ARST, Measurement of Air in Houses or MA document for the best placement of the measurement devices. Next slide. The NRPP, I hate acronyms, but the NRPP, or National Radon Proficiency Program, provides the mastery of specific skills required to successfully complete radon testing and remedial projects. The NRSB, or National Radon Safety Board, certifies radon professionals. They have some great resources on their website for finding radon professionals. And both of these websites also include a list of approved devices. Next slide. So now you've done your testing and you've gotten your results back from the lab. The numbers are interesting, but what do they mean? On the left is a graph from a digital monitor over a 30-day period. And in the middle is the result from a short-term test showing 0.5 picocuries per liter. There's no safe level for radon, but radon below 2.0 is tolerable. When the label level is between two and four picocuries per liter, you may want to consider mitigation. And above four is a health risk and you need to mitigate. The EPA recommends retesting every two years. And certain states like Minnesota recommend retesting every two to five years. Next slide. Now in a new building, a passive radon system is a place to start. The stack effect that we talked about before, the stack effect in the pipe may be enough to provide airflow to transport the gases up and out of the building. If the flow is not great enough to control the radon level, an inline fan can be added outside the pressure boundary of the house in an attic, for example, to increase the flow rate. Installing and labeling the pipe and installing an electrical connection during construction is much easier than adding it later. Installing the pipe all the way up and through the house and through the roof 
makes the passive approach only reasonable in new construction. Next slide. It's important to locate the radon fan outside the pressure boundary of the house. There may be air leaks around the fan connections or the fan housing itself. It is important for those pressurized leaks to be outside the pressure boundary and thermal boundaries of the house to keep the radon gas from leaking back into the living space. Next slide. If the fan cannot be located outside the pressure and thermal boundaries, the fan must be located on the exterior. Next slide. Active mitigation in, consists of an inline fan that draws the radon gases from the soil beneath the foundation, channels it up the pipe and releases it outside above the roof. More detailed information on mitigation strategies will be presented in the next webinar. Next slide. All active radon mitigation systems, those with a fan, are required to have a manometer installed so the homeowner can see if the radon fan is working. It's mounted on the radon vent pipe and is usually in the basement or garage. The suction created by the radon fan or the building stack pressure, the fluid up pulls, draws the fluid up on one side of the manometer. There's a small piece of clear tubing that goes from the top of the manometer to a small hole in the radon vent pipe. The other side of the manometer is left open. If the manometer fluid levels are different, it indicates that the fan is running. If the fluid levels in the U-tube are equal, then the radon fan is not working and may need to be replaced. Next slide. Leaves and acorns can fall or be dropped down the radon pipe, blocking the flow. A rain cap on the top of the pipe will block the flow and is prohibited in some jurisdictions. But a screen or a critter guard with half inch openings will allow the air to flow and prohibit the intrusion of foreign objects. And labeling the PVC radon pipe is important so that it is not mistaken for a plumbing pipe. Next slide. So where do I find a radon professional? You have choices when you're seeking out a professional. There's not one national list of radon professionals. You can start by going to your state radon program. And this is an excerpt from the National Radon Safety Board's website. Next slide. On the NRSB website, you can enter your zip code and desired radius and the website will kick out a list of radon professionals. Next slide. Another alternative is the listing through the NRPP, the National Radon Proficiency Program. There are lots of qualified individuals out there. Next slide. And one more quick check. Which The answer to this one, as you so wisely selected, is very definitely false. Manufactured homes, homes with crawl space, trailers, anything that touches the ground is at risk. The elevated home on the right may be okay because it doesn't have an enclosed 
crawl space. And next slide. There is a great deal of information out there available uh, and there's always more to learn. So thank you for listening and back to you, Catherine. All right, thank you, Paul. Now I want to spend the next half hour on Q&A discussion. Uh, we have a panel consisting of, I'll, I'll be the moderator um, and Paul will participate, but we also have from Kansas State University, uh, Brian Hansen and Christina Snyder. Um, could you briefly introduce yourselves, uh, maybe starting with Brian? Uh, yes, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Brian Hansen. Um, I uh, kind of oversee the radon programs here at Kansas State University. Uh, we are housed in the College of Engineering's Extension Office, and uh, we've uh, I and Christina between us have 30 plus years uh, dealing with uh, these types of issues. So yeah, dated myself a bit. <laughs> My name is Christina Snyder. Like Brian said, I work with him at the Engineering Extension Office uh, at the Engineering College at K-State University, and we are the contractor with the EPA for the National Radon Program Services. Uh, we provide technical outreach and support both and to the professional community, and so we're really glad to be invited and hope we have some answers for you. Yeah, I'm really excited that you guys are joining us. And maybe, Christina, if you could talk a little bit more about KSU and the uh, National Radon Program Services that um, you guys are part of and just kind of the context of what you guys are. For sure, sure. We're contracted with the EPA to provide outreach again, like I said, to the public and to the professional community. We answer five 800 numbers across the, the country from uh, questions that folks have during testing, often during real estate transactions. Some We have been called from crawl spaces with questions about why isn't this working like I expect from the professional side. Uh, and we obviously talk to home homeowners who are doing their own tests and also uh, homeowners who are about to be homeowners who are doing tests during real estate transactions. We also manage the sosradon.org website. Uh, there are years worth of uh, <laughs> data and research there for folks to uh, um, look through if that's of interest to them. It is also a place where you can find your local state radon office contact information. Uh, we try to maintain those and go through them every year or two to make sure we've got the right names and phone numbers and email addresses for everybody. So sosradon.org is a great place to start if you need if you need your uh, state radon office information. Uh, we also run radon training for professionals out of our office. We also house a radon chamber, which is something that the professional community needs. Uh, we are the only second, uh, one of two secondary radon chambers in the country. So we have done a lot of radon things out of K-State since, 1988, 90, somewhere right in there. We were a part of the original EPA radon uh, training centers when they formed those in the early 90s. Wow, that's so much expertise there. Um, and turning to Paul, could you give more information about EPA's Indoor Air Plus for those of us who might not know what the program is or what that designation means? Sure, uh, the in Indoor Air Plus program is an add-on to um, basically to Energy Star. Um, when you're building a new home, um, you get an Energy Star home and that handles your energy issues. And Indoor Air Plus adds on the indoor air quality elements of the house. And one of those elements, of course, is, is the radon issue. Okay. Now turning to audience questions, I'll start with the ones that came in through registration and then we'll move to the ones that are in the Q&A uh, live queue. Um, so we'll try to get to all of them, see how much time we have. And if we don't get to everything, then we will try to have a, an FAQ document posted along with the webinar materials. And um, in case you missed the beginning or missed this detail, this webinar is being recorded and the slides, transcripts, and recording, along with any supplemental materials, will be available online in a couple of weeks. All right, so uh, let me kick this to Brian. Um, is radon a greater risk in colder climates? I know earlier Paul mentioned that a home that's being heated might have more of a stack effect. So um, are, we, are we saying that radon is a greater risk in colder climates and what's climate change, how's that going to affect radon exposure risk? So 
generally speaking, radon values are going to be the highest when the box of the building is closed. And the, you know, the times of year when we're closing that box, obviously in winter when we're actively heating the air in the house, which can you know, maximize the stack effect of the home and can lead to some additional radon intrusion, but also when we're running our air conditioners. So the protocols for testing, you know, for short-term tests, anything under 90 days, as Paul indicated, is closed building because we're, we're trying to see what those radon values look like when you have the box closed, which for some people is 365 days, uh, we're, you know, irregardless of their climate. And for other people, it may be you know, two or three months of the year. So just recognize that when we are doing our testing, um, the goal is to see what the box looks like rather than you know, get too hung up on seasonality. There is a little bit of seasonality, uh, as Paul indicated. Right, so what I'm hearing is you can have high radon levels in Florida and Texas as much as you have in colder states. Correct. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, maybe next one to Christina. Um, what affects the accumulation of radon in any particular area? And I, I know Paul mentioned this, but just in case it uh, didn't completely get through to folks, um, what, what are different things that can affect the amount of radon being concentrated? So, and the word that was used in the original question was persistency. Right. Uh, and so persistency isn't a word I would use to describe radon once it's in the house, but it is a, a, certainly a word that should be used to describe its source, right? The biggest factor in whether or not any building on Earth, because if your building touches Earth, it has radon in it. And so the biggest factor that determines whether any building tests high is whether or not there is a strong source of radon and a pathway through the, the soil gas in, in the planet to the building, the under, underside of the building, right? So we can't tell where that is because that source is the uranium in the Earth's crust. And so the uranium will be there for as long as any of us are alive, plus many great grand generations. Um, and it, it has a very long half-life, which means there will be plenty of source. And there is no way to tell what that, what that pathway is to the house. Once the radon is in the home, it's, it travels on the air currents in the house. It's also a single molecule. So it's a very, very tiny element. And so once it comes into the airspace of a home or a building, it does also migrate outside of the walls, right? So it's a constant source being fed to the house and then a constant amount of it going out uh, through the, the walls and, and windows and around the cracks and any place that connects inside air with outside air from the building. Um, so those are the big things. As Paul and Brian have discussed, the stack effect makes that makes the pull from the ground harder, which which will encourage more radon to come up into it. It also will encourage more radon to leave the top of the building or the sides as as that stack effect works. Um, so there are a number of factors in buildings that are aerodynamically fairly complex that that determine how radon becomes traps in the box, as as we were talking in the previous question. Um, but the main thing is whether or not there's a source and there is no way to know what that source is. So you have to test to know what those levels are. And then as we've discussed, there are ways to fix it. Um, so whatever that level is shouldn't, shouldn't be concerning because we can fix it after we have figured out that it's there in high levels. Mm. And then Brian, uh, does topography affect radon levels? And if so, how? To a certain extent, uh, there are certain geological features in some areas of the country, uh, the biggest one being what are called karst areas, which uh, are areas of the country that ha can have substantial caving networks underneath them. Uh, karst situations can lead to some really weird seasonal inversions of radon from extremely high to extremely low across seasons, but that's the exception rather than the norm. Um, if the building is touching soil, there's a potential for elevated levels of radon. Hmm. And uh, on a related note, um, this one for Christina, um, can we assume that mobile homes don't need to be tested? Unfortunately not. Again, if it's touching the ground and there's a, a connection point from the ground that, that contains airspace to the underneath of the building, regardless of whether that's a crawl space, which is effectively what a, a mobile home or a manufactured home is, or a slab on grade or a basement, 
then it, there is a potential and a possibility, again, if you have a strong source of radon. And again, we don't know where those strong sources are. So we have actually had mobile homes test high. They had exceedingly tight skirting on the bottom, but that was important because they didn't want the pipes to freeze in the winter. They didn't want to deal with critters under there. So if you have, if, if there is a structure that, that makes the building envelope come all the way to the ground, then it is a possibility that a, a home may test high for radon. Mm -hmm. And a uh, related question to that, which um, is manufactured housing with skirting considered open air and therefore not a risk for high radon concentrations. Um, I'm hearing no for that. You're saying that with not necessarily have skirting. you have to test it, right? If the if the radon levels are high enough, even if you have crawl space with crawl space vents open or loose skirting on a manufactured or a mobile home, if there's enough radon coming up under the house in the right place, then the connections from the floorboards into the into the breathing space of the home. Again, we're concerned with where your face is in the house. That's what we want to know the air, the radon level of. So if there is enough radon underneath, it will also be in the building in high enough numbers to be concerning and to need, need some uh, dealing with. Okay. And Brian, um, is are the radon levels different um, or the entry routes different or higher or lower risk for houses that are slab on grade versus houses with basements? Nope. Uh, again, it's all about the point of connection to the, uh, to the soil and where the source is. So if you have a house next to, you know, if you have a slab on grade house next to a house with a basement next to a house that has a crawl space, any one of those houses has an equal probability of being elevated if the source is connected to that particular foundation. Now, will radon values stratify within a house to a certain extent? Yes. So generally, the further away you move from the ground contact, the lower the radon inside the building will be because one, it's spreading into a larger volume of space, so it's diluting itself more. And two, you're getting more outside air infiltration as you go up through the building acting as a dilutant factor. But no, it's all about soil connection. So unfortunately, if we touch the soil, we can have radon. Mm. Um, and then for Christina, besides testing, is there a best way to assess the likelihood of radon presence for an initial screening of risk? No, the short-term radon test is the best initial screening tool. You can't predict radon levels by any means, not testing the soil beforehand, not knowing that the townhome next door was high or low. None of that will tell you anything about whether your home tests high. Again, because we have no way to figure out where the uranium that is ultimately breaking down into radium and radon is in the Earth's crust. It might be 400 feet underground or in the next county, and whether or not there's a path from that source to your building, there is no way to predict what those levels are. Okay, and Brian, I know we'll go over this more in the next webinar, but would mitigation strategies be different for building where the levels are between two to four picocuries versus more than four picocuries? Uh, no. Um, the, the challenge is, is all buildings will have a lower level of achievability, right? So the current standard active soil depressurization mitigation systems that uh, Paul briefly uh, introduced are going to be effective uh, first time out with a single pipe and fan and suction point system at taking any house that's four or higher to less than, uh, to less than four 95% of the time. Okay, so we have an extraordinarily, extraordinarily high efficacy rate when we have a lot of radon. But if we're starting with levels below four, we can still use the same mitigation technologies to try to get under two. But when we're starting with those lower levels, how much additional reduction we can achieve is much, much more difficult to predict because it just, the closer you get to theoretical zero, the harder and harder and harder it gets to get those radon levels any further down. And then Christina, um, with the existing state EPA and CDC data, um, can you discuss what the gaps are and what we can learn from those data sets? Sure. The first thing to keep in mind is that those are data sets. They are not predictive. They are uh, representative of the tests that have been done in those areas. Um, I think somebody asked in the Q&A about uh, current radon maps. The CDC maps are are great. They're using the data uh, from the test kit companies across the country and the state programs together. Most state programs have updated uh, maps that come 
that have been updated with the current test, the tests from the last 15, 20, 25 years, depending on how long they've been um, recording those at the state level. But there are always limitations, right? And you discussed some, some great examples, right? The city of, of Austin is millions of people. They have 386 tests that are recorded in their map. It's not a statistical representative sample. When the EPA created their original map, they had some number, I, I don't know what the number was, but they had some number of tests out of every one of the 3,100 counties in the US. But if you look at that map, there's a big yellow spot in Nebraska in the Western half of Nebraska. Nebraska has since had testing uh, requirements and professionals uh, are, are required to do that kind of testing for pay in that state for several years, uh, several decades at this point. Those counties are yellow in part on the EPA original map from the early 90s because they didn't have very many data points because there are not very many people living there. Those are bigger pieces of property. They're mostly farm, et cetera. And they didn't turn over in real estate sales very quickly. And so now that map is red. Nebraska is basically entirely red because that is that is the represent more representative data that sets that has come up. So ideally we want every house tested. In fact, the Surgeon General has has suggested that that be what we're aiming for because we can't predict it. And because even if you have tested now, uh, things you have no control over, cracks in the earth, dryness in the ground, may change your radon levels in your home, even with a mitigation system. And so we want to periodically test, even if your tests are low, because sometimes stuff changes. So there are limitations to those data sets, but the more testing we do and the more, the more times people change the housing ownership and do a test during that, the more we learn about how radon is acting in our particular areas. Thank you for that. Um, next one for Paul. Does increasing in energy efficiency in buildings through, you know, the more insulated building envelope, does that ironically increase the radon concentration because you have more of the closed home condition, um, so for example, through like better insulated windows with less indoor outdoor air exchange? Is that is that sort of like a pro and con of energy having more energy efficiency? Is that is that actually a thing or is that uh, misconception. Well, as as Brian mentioned earlier, the more you tighten up the house, the more you trap everything that's inside. Um, and so part of any of these tight home programs has to be a, um, a variety of uh, ventilation systems. And one of those ventilation systems certainly should be the, the radon uh, mitigation to keep that soil gas outside out of the uh, in, inside of the pressure boundary. So it, it tightening up a house um, improves the air quality if you have a decent ventilation system in it and that improves the occupants health and that improves their productivity and they get better sleep <laughs> and everything else. So <laughs> tightening up a house is a great thing to do but you got to put in uh, the ventilation system and uh, dedicated radon mitigation. Very good. Um, okay, so the next one I'll do uh, punt to Brian. Um, how much radon is released when showering? Um, I know Paul mentioned earlier that uh, well water can uh, can have radon, and so if you're showering, then that's one route of entry for radon. So how how much is really released with that, and is, is that really a concern? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're on public water, probably not. Uh, generally speaking, the radon and water issue is a private well water issue. So generally, if you have a single family house that's on a private well, potentially, as we've seen in North Carolina in some cases where we may have a small subdivision that's using a community well, if the well water being tapped and sent directly to the house has a high enough concentration of radon dissolved into that well water, then yes, anything you do that aerates the water, breaks that water down into small water droplets and exposes those water droplets to the air, like your showers, your laundry, and your dishwashers. So those are the big three aerators of water in your house, will release some of that radon to the indoor air. Now, the very rough rule of thumb based on an average family of four's water usage is that for about every 10,000 picocuries of radon in the well water, the average family of four's water usage is going to add about one picocuri to the indoor air. 
but again, that's based on a you know on on a fairly small number of water users. If you're in a large building that has a substantial water turnover, uh, and I'm going to give you a weird example since this is a housing seminar, but we have seen even in you know in fish hatcheries where we've had occupational exposure problems at maybe 100 or 200 picocuries in the well water that is being used, but they're turning over hundreds of thousands of gallons of water and therefore releasing enough radon to create an occupational exposure. So. Everything about the water issue is very, very specific to the individual situation and requires very specific types of testing to determine if we have a problem or not. Wow, that was a very interesting example, Brian, with the fish hatcheries. I'll have to keep that one in mind when talking to folks in hatcheries in the future. Uh, Christina, um, is radon more of a concern in old homes versus new homes? Does that matter? Nope, it's all about the source strength. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record because uh, it's it's really amazing to me when I got into radon. I am actually trained as a, trained as a landscape architect, so but I have also gone through the process to be uh, certified as a radon measurement professional and mitigation professional. So uh, our houses are very very complex aerodynamically, and my example is that the house I live in in Kansas is a hundred years old. It is leaky as all get out. I have 2.5 air changes per hour in this house when we moved into it. And when we moved in, our levels tested at about the indoor average at 1.4 picocuries. We went back and reglazed every one of those 100-year-old windows. There were like 30 of them in the building. We tripled the insulation in the attic. It was balloon frame. We did as much as we could to keep the air from going up and down because we didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars heating it in the winter in Kansas or cooling it in the summer. Uh, after all of that, like a good radon professional, I went back and tested again, and our levels had come down to 0.4, which is the outdoor average, which is functionally as low as you're going to make a building, right? So my house was sucking like crazy on the ground when it was two and a half air changes per hour. It was turning over so much air that it was pulling every little bit of radon that was available under my house into my house, into my breathable airspace. And when I stopped it from pulling so hard, my levels dropped. I made it tighter and my levels went down. My house is 100 years old. So was my neighbors. They had a radon system that was on and continually running to, to deal with theirs. Their house had a source. My house didn't. So it isn't about how it's constructed. It's not about how old it is. To an extent, it's not about how leaky it is. If there's a source, your house is going to test high. And then we can fix it for you. OK, that's um, really Great personal example there. Uh, let's go to the question and answers from the live audience um, while we still have time. Um, and there's a question on, are there standards for workplaces, public buildings, et cetera, for radon levels? Um, we'll talk more about the testing and mitigation standards on the next webinar, but um, in terms of just, um, are there standards for the radon levels? Uh, Brian, can you speak to yes, no? Uh, complicated. Um, so there is an OSHA occupational limit of 100 picocuries averaged over a 40 hour work week. Um, amusingly, however, there's not a concurrent OSHA requirement to test your occupational space to see if you've exceeded that. Uh, that rule was put into place in the late 70s based on known occupational exposures in mining environments before we recognized that there could be indoor radon values. So there is an absolute occupational OSHA limit. Now on the federal government side of things, however, there is uh, the General Services Administration does have different uh, some different guidances for GSA leased or owned properties for non-residential or school spaces that are GSA leased. There's a 25 picocuri limit for residential and school uh, spaces leased or owned by the GSA. There's a four picocuri limit. Okay, and the next one for Christina, um, this is similar to a question we received previously um, through the registration. Um, will you discuss how radon determinations are made on raw land or undeveloped land where proposed housing is to be constructed? So sort of talking to how do you know what your radon levels are going to be before you've constructed? Sadly, you can't. We did, we did check into it in the early part of this process when the EPA was putting together training information and and trying to get some resources out there so we could work there. 
when you test the soil for radon, what it's going to tell you is that there's radon in the soil. And we have a map we use in our training, which is a house tested in New Jersey. They had soil levels from 12,000 and a half to 750 to like 15. They built the house. The house was 1.5 once they got it done because it is kind of point sourcey, right? So if you get the test and you've got the piece of soil that is closest to some source of radon, it's gonna test high. But how that radon molecule travels up out of that soil into the airspace is what's important. And so it, once the house was built, it wasn't. What we generally say, it's also relatively expensive to test soil for radon. What we generally say is you spend those monies instead, putting in radon resistant new construction uh, uh, techniques, and that's those are available, and the standards exist for both multifamily units, uh, large commercial buildings, and single-family type structures. So they there are standards out there for any kind of building you're going to build. Spend your money putting those features in rather than testing the soil beforehand. It would be awesome if you could test it and be like, this is where my basement living room is going to be. That's what I want to know, but it just isn't functional. Okay, um, and. I'm reading through the questions. Uh, one question more about the health effects. Uh, this one I'll move to Brian. Um, are there other types of cancer caused by radon or is it typically lung cancers or have other cancers not been studied relative to radon levels? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna give you the hard answer and then the soft answer. Um, the hard answer is uh, if you're drinking well water with substantially elevated levels of radon, there is a substan there, there is a potential increase in risk of stomach and bladder cancer as well. But let's put this in perspective. Radon in the air accounts for about 12% of annual lung cancer deaths in the United States, which is, depending on the year, 20 to 25,000 deaths. There are only about 6,000 total new cases of stomach cancer uh, diagnosed annually in the US, of which maybe 10%. So 600, 700 of those cases are gonna be radon related. So the risk is real and I don't wanna downplay that, but our substantive concern is related to the lung cancer risk of the airborne concentrations. Now, what a lot of people do see online, however, and, and, gen and this generates some questions about radon, is that ionizing radiation of which radon is one form of ionizing radiation that we're exposed to in the environment, have been linked to triggering things like lymphoma, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. But what we do not have is a way for the radiation from the polonium that you are inhaling into your lungs and that is adhering to and sticking to the cells in the lungs, which is where the radiation is then delivered to move that polonium to those other systems in the body to move that source of radiation to those other systems in the body. So the short answer is there's no link between radon directly to these other disorders, but people can sometimes conflate that because of the fact that they are being potentially triggered by similar effects. Okay. Sorry, I hate non-answers, but that's what it is. Right, <sighs> yeah, and the studies mostly focus on lung cancer because that one has been more proven and the other ones are more tenuous and they're more indirect right. roots yes. for that. Um, and then for Christina, for homes that are raised off the ground and open, um, so there's no structural enclosure around the raised area, um, is there any height recommendation, um, such as how high off the ground should be, should homes be, um, or be raised or built to avoid increased risk of radon exposure inside the home? We don't really approach it that way. Uh, now, if you're talking about a stilt house on the on the beach, wherever you are on the beach. Um, that can help because there's lots of good airflow underneath. However, when you put that little closet in there, so you can put your floaties and your beach bikes and all that stuff, and that little closet comes down and touches the ground and also touches the under part of your house, you've now made a connection where radon can come up if there's a, law, if there's a strong source of radon. Um, so, eh, <laughs> because again, the thing that <laughs> determines whether a building tests high actually doesn't really have anything to do with the structure of the building. It has to do with whether or not there's a strong source. Now, the other kind of conflating thing is that if you've got a stilt house, you're typically down there on a sand beach somewhere. And generally that kind of substrate, even deep into the earth is containing less uranium and therefore is, is having less source. So those houses tend to test lower anyway, regardless of whether they're got a basement that they're constantly pumping up 
so that the you know seawater doesn't come in or whatever, or they're on stilts because they're out on the on the edge. The other thing to keep in mind is that in some portions of the country, Alaska comes to mind, if you build a 25 foot stick house up in the air, you're going to have to do an awful lot of insulation to keep your your pipe, your water pipes have to come up there somewhere if you've got indoor plumbing, I guess. If you don't, you're, you're probably good. But every every one of those penetrations that comes into the home, if it's coming from the ground into the house, there is right there a connection point. And typically you, you are gonna have to build the structure so that you can keep all of your facilities intact without, you know, you don't want water damage because things are freezing. You don't, you don't wanna have to deal with, I don't know, squirrels or mice eating your electric lines, whatever it is, we build our houses the way we build them because we need them to function for us to live in. And so we don't, we don't have recommendations for you know, this distance off or that far from these things um, because we want you to build the house that works for what you need it and deal with the radon on the front end, or if you forgot or didn't, build deal with the radon on the back end. Okay, and then uh, there's a clarification I want to make um, where there's a question saying that Paul mentioned 2.0 as the level where EPA would recommend mitigation, but that wasn't on the, on the scale that I had earlier. So there's a EPA 2.0, there's a WHO 2.7, what's recommended mitigation level. Um, and so maybe I'll go back to that previous slide um, that they're referring to. When you're above four picocuries, that's definitely a health risk and it's in the occupant's uh, best, con uh, yeah, best interest for the building to be mitigated um, to lower the risk of developing lung cancer. Um, between two to four is below the EPA action level, but you should consider fixing. The 2.7 on the WHO action level, that is not really mentioned um, in terms of policy decisions or mitigation decisions by any of the, of the standards or EPA recommendations. So, so if you're under two, that's great. Retest every few years to make sure the level hasn't changed. Um, we'll talk more about that next next webinar. If you're between two and four, then the recommendation is, yeah, if you have the resources, you should fix, you should consider fixing it. Um, but I think it was Brian who mentioned earlier, you know, when you get to those lower levels, the the mitigation might not be as effective as, you know, if you're above eight picocuries, then oh, doing the same mitigation is going to have a greater effect. Um, so, and what would it be? Uh, accurate, uh, Brian, if I said um, between two and four picocuries, it's more of a risk-benefit analysis where um, the cost of the system versus the health benefits you're getting, maybe that's more nebulous? Depends on the situation, um, but you're correct. Uh, generally speaking, when a short-term test comes back between two and four, two and 3.9, okay? And if that is in a commonly occupied level of the house, Generally, what we recommend is before you make a mitigation decision, we still need to do a second test anyway by the standards. We recommend doing an alpha track for 91 days or longer, but including winter, right? So you include the same number of months on a long-term test plus one additional season, either before or after the winter season. And if that long-term average is under two, including winter, then quite frankly, there's not a lot to be done. The house is already as low as we really can expect to get it. But if that long-term average is two to 3.9 and there's a, there's a teenager's bedroom and they're gonna be in that bedroom for another five years before they go off to college, yeah, go for it. Put the mitigation system in, try to get under two. I think the thing to, to pop in there is that a large percentage of the lung cancers induced by radon exposure are induced at radon levels under four. Yes. Because the reason we focus so hard on residential properties is because you spend most of, as a percentage of your, of your existence, you spend most of your time at home. You're asleep and you don't realize that you're at home because you're not counting those one hopes six to 10 hours of sleeping uh, and getting dressed and eating breakfast and you know gathering everybody and pushing the kids out the door and letting the dog in and out. And all of those things that you do at home are home exposures. And so that as a percentage of your exposure is a very large percentage of your exposure. And so even levels under four can cause radon-induced lung cancer over your lifetime. 
and anything we can do to lower those levels for that chunk of your day that you're in your residence is going to be beneficial in the long run for your for your uh, lung cancer risk. Okay, and then a couple of quick ones before we wrap up. Uh, Paul, um, in a multifamily building where if you have a higher level unit, test higher than the units below it, even when you retest it, um, what does that mean? Why, why is this higher unit testing higher? Because it feels like it. <laughs> um, I mean, they, they, there must be uh, interstitial cavities that would conduct uh, air flow up from the lower levels uh, up to the higher levels. But as again, Brian mentioned that the higher you go, it's the more dissipated it's likely to be. But I found, you know, in my own house, it's an old house and there are old duct runs down into the basement. Uh, and uh, level on the second floor was higher than the level in the basement. But uh, it just, it's pretty random stuff. Can I add quickly to that? Yep. If you're, uh, if you got a three-story house and all of the showers are on the, 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 you know, the third story or the second story above ground, and you have a well water, you know, a well water problem. Where is the radon going to be released when you aerate the water from the shower? It's going to be released on the level where all the showers are at on that second story. So that's one indicator that you might have in a single family house a water problem on your well. The other issue, though, is building materials. It is possible, particularly with all concrete structures such as concrete block houses in Florida or all concrete high rise buildings that the concrete itself can start to act as, a, as the point source rather than the soil. This is where large buildings start to get a lot more complex and the mitigation techniques that we're talking about for single family will have absolutely no play whatsoever in a situation like that. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Brian. Um, Christina, can opening windows help reduce radon exposure because they can escape the building? Temporarily, sometimes. You'll, you'll find, as you probably have noticed, that there are a lot of gray areas in radon. Because our houses and our buildings are so very aerodynamically complex, yes, if you have all the doors and windows open, you may get a good air exchange there and dilute what radon is coming up into the building. It is typically not going to work if your radon levels are very high, but it certainly can in, in some of the elevated levels that are on the lower end of elevated. Uh, however, that being said, as soon as it's too cold or too hot or too smoky or too full of allergens and you close those windows back up, the radon will come back up to wherever it tests with closed house conditions in about 12 hours. Also, you could, if you're opening not the, not the wind side, but the leeward side of building because you don't want the papers to blow off your desk, you may actually artificially make your house suck harder and raise your radon levels with your windows open. So yes, sometimes, but it isn't a, it's not a permanent fix. The permanent fix is the ASD system that, that Paul roughly reviewed that we'll be talking about next time. Thank you. And I know we still have uh, about 30 open questions that we haven't gotten to today. Some of it is on HUD policy. We're not talking about what HUD requirements are until HUD's department-wide policy actually comes out. So stay tuned for the third webinar. We have a lot of, a lot of questions on testing uh, te testing techniques, testing results, um, mitigation, mitigation strategies, different things to um, consider. Uh, yeah, different strategies for mitigation. We will cover that in the second webinar that is going to be on August 14th. So that's in about three weeks. So we still might not get to everything there, but that would be the appropriate place to bring those questions up again if we haven't gotten to that. And once again, this webinar is being recorded. The slides and materials will be available online on the HUD Exchange website um, in a few weeks. And registrants will receive a notification once the recording is available. Um, any last minute thoughts or comments from any of the panelists or HUD folks on the call? I saw a misplaced question in the chat that I'm going to very quickly address. There was a question about earthquakes. Uh, question, the, and the short answer is, 
earthquakes will not change the source. The source strength, as we've been talking about, is consistent. But if the if there is a regional earthquake that leads to foundation damage that can open additional pathways connecting the soil to the indoor environment, change the porosity of the soil underneath the foundation, et cetera, this can lead to a, a change in indoor radon values. Okay. And there's a handful of questions in the chat that are uh, we, we will be talking <laughs> more about next time, right? How we do mitigation, what, what's the point of, of doing radon resistant new construction, and what are the various costs of the options? Those, those we'll cover next time. And real quickly, Brian, Christina, um, you mentioned that you guys answer so many questions um, through your program uh, throughout the year. How do folks get in touch with you if they have questions they want to direct um, to KSU's program? Our, you, our website, I, I, I guess I can put it in the chat here. Our website is sosradon.org. Sorry, talking while I'm typing. Uh, we have <laughs> our email addresses on there, our phone number, where we are five of us that answer the, the hotline calls. Um, and we all talk to one another. So if you get somebody who doesn't have that answer, we will track it down for you. Our email address is radon at ksu.edu. And you're welcome to send your questions that way or or there is a, a um, like a contact us, fill us thing on our, our website, but mostly we get spam out of that. So direct to email, direct email to radon at ksu.edu uh, or give us a call and we'd be happy to chat. If you can't find what's on our website, we have tons of resources on the website. Just kind of scroll through the left-hand navigation and it may be there already for you. Thank you for that. Um, and once again, all of the sources and links and databases we mentioned today are linked in the PowerPoint presentation. So when the materials are available, you'll be able to click on those links and navigate and play around with those resources yourselves. Um, so um, if there are no further comments from the panelists or HUD, then we will end the webinar and talk to you next time. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you everyone.